name is Joris Leinek, I'm Dutch, so you won't waste the next 10 minutes guessing where my accent is coming from. Um, if you are a banker, five minutes later, you can be an ex-banker. Just imagine if you're, you're all returning to your jobs tomorrow, and you go to your desk, and opposite you, your colleague is just gone. Stuff is cleared out, just gone. Nobody talks about the colleague, it's just poof. This is what it's like to be a banker, is every quarter, people start talking sort of like, do you think it's today, do you think it's today, do you think it's today, and then Tuesdays, because Human Resources never does it on a Monday, Tuesdays, people sit down and suddenly the phone rings, and somebody gets up, picks up his stuff, and walks towards Human Resources, and people realize it's beginning. And so this sort of wave of panic washes over the trading floor, and all day people just sit there by their phone, and when it says undisclosed number, they're like, no. And they pick it up and it's a client. Oh, sorry. It's a client. It's not human resources. But a little later, it is human resources. And five minutes later, they're marched out of the building by security. Their phone is blocked. Their security pass is blocked. Their email is blocked. And they never talked about it again. Now, this is an example of something that is new to me. And I think new to most people who don't know anything about banking. Maybe if you're... I'm told Americans actually think it takes such a long time to get rid of people in England. Uh, so Americans are used to even more, even less job security. But to me, from the Rhineland model in the Netherlands, this was shocking. And it completely changed my perception of the news. Whenever I see bankers now, whenever I hear talk about financial reform, I think, yeah, but they can be fired in five minutes. So how can you expect bankers to take the long view if they can be out of the door in five minutes? How can you expect them to sort of sound the alarm about risks if there are regular cullings every quarter and people are just, human resources just goes down the list and says, this one goes, this one goes, this one goes. So this example between news and new is I think one of the sort of really exciting new developments in, in journalism. And I'm incredibly lucky to be with The Guardian, which is really, which may be outsold by um, the eye because it's free. Um, <laughs> Almost free. Uh, and it's run by a trust, so we have more money to experiment, which is great. So I'd, I do not wish in any sort of way to belittle other organizations that uh, have to deal with major cuts. But it's what's fantastic about The Guardian is they, they sort of said, OK, um, yours, why don't you come work for us? And why don't you stop thinking out of the box? Because there is no box. <laughs> we have to think beyond the box. Because every side of the box that defined journalism has collapsed. Audiences cannot participate. Everything we write is in one place, in an, uh, on the web. We can work for the long tail. So just sort of try to think as disruptively as you can. And so this is what I've been trying to do. And I feel a bit like um, we're in the news organizations are like steamships. And we've just entered the age of aviation. And um, this is really gets my colleagues riled up. Um, you think about yourself as a steamship, you look around, you think, ah, oh, we're the Guardian, we're ahead of the other steamships, until you look up and you see the planes going overhead. <laughs> and I think what happened to mobility, thanks to aviation, will happen to information. We'll just have a lot more and a lot better stuff, and we'll still have the steamships. And so I feel a bit like the very early days of aviation, you had these guys who glued feathers to their arms and went like this. <laughs> and uh, furiously flapping, and it usually didn't work. But at the end of the day, we had a plane. So when you see somebody flapping like this, don't ask him, great, how are you going to monetize that? Because you're never going to think beyond the box if somebody pulls you right back into the box and says, how are you going to monetize that within the box? Now, this was the, this was the plan. So we take a really interesting subject that is highly inaccessible, um, laden with jargon and uh, TLAs, three-letter acronyms. Haha, um, <laughs> ha, yeah. And uh, can we make it accessible to outsiders, using everything that technology can do for us now? And uh, basically, I just sat down and I realized, okay, I know nothing about finance, which is where you are. <laughs> you don't know anything about finance either. Reading the Financial Times, you pretend. But unless you're a real insider, you don't really know what all these terms mean. Um, so I can go the old route, which is to become an insider offline and then start writing for other insiders. 
but it's actually with the web now, with the long tail, what I can do is I can start to document my own journey from outsider to insider. So I'm just going to start with a question that every outsider probably wants to know, interview lots of bankers, post all these interviews online, and then start writing wrap-ups, and thereby sort of documenting a learning curve about the world of finance, and we'll see where we go. And so this job security thing came up. Um, how it worked, um, in, the, in the beginning I would go to 10 bankers and say, okay, everybody hates you. I know there are a few bankers here, um, sorry, <laughs> everybody hates you. Um, do you hate yourself? No. Um, that's called cognitive dissonance. Um, no. <laughs> you don't hate yourself. So why don't you meet with me and tell me why you don't hate yourself? How can bankers live with themselves and what kind of people are they? So I did 10 interviews anonymously so they wouldn't get fired immediately. Um, and I posted these 10 plus a kind of wrap-up piece like, wow, this is actually quite interesting. Um, and then I supplied an email address for new volunteers. And the first 10 were all men because they're risk takers, so they dared to speak to a journalist. And they were all very positive. Being men, they said, I have a great job. I'm doing really well. I'm a happy banker. And then lots of women started writing in. Well, actually, I also work for a bank, but I hate it. <laughs> I'm not in the I love my job camp at all. And this one of those bankers, technically not a banker, was, was in HR. And she um, sort of wrote into the Gmail account and said, look, you know, if you want to meet and hear what it's like to fire these people all the time, I'm, I'm ready to go if you can guarantee my an anonymity. So I had, and the interview is now online, of course, uh, forever, uh, where she just describes what it's like to sort of get people in every five minutes and tell them that their life is over and that they can go home and tell their kids that the private school fees can no longer be paid and how these people react and how you sort of go down the list and say, okay, this one is probably going to blow up, so we need security, so if we fire them a little later, then we can pull it with the other guy who's also probably going to blow up, and this one will probably take it well. That's how it works. And this sort of stuff could never go into a newspaper because if you would put it in a newspaper, what's the chance of somebody sort of wanting to read this at that day and it would be printed, and the next day it's fish wrap. But now with the long tail, they're sitting just waiting for audiences. You can suddenly do all kinds of interviews and produce all sorts of information that uh, would never qualify for a paper, but would certainly find its audience over time. And thanks to uh, social media, uh, over time these interviews collect a lot of views, and um, especially thanks to the social network that dare not speak its name here, um, suddenly you see the, the Facebook recommends shoot up, and even the Google Plus recommends sometimes, uh, because people, <laughs> people alert each other to a story. And this is, what, this is how it's been going. It's been a sort of a running conversation between insiders and outsiders in finance. And you could never have done this, uh, say, 20 years ago, if only because you need a special email account. So most bankers make a special email account to get in touch with me, and we meet in secret. I, I write it up from notes. I send it to them, see if it for, check for accuracy, omissions, and identifiable detail. Then it goes online. Then people start commenting, and then the interviewee can jump in too and begin and carry on the conversation. And it's incredibly exciting, and it's also very different. In the old days, as a journalist, you, you have to sort of pump yourself up and pretend you know everything, you know? I got the story first. And now I can, I'm this facilitator, and I can sort of share my amazement and say, look, I can't believe you people have no job security. Uh, what's it like? And then new information comes in, and so you're slowly, this whole thing is filling up. And I've sort of, because you need, if you're sometimes on the speaker circuit, you need a few catchphrases. So I've called it uh, sharing my learning curve. And whether you can learn by seeing other people learn. And um, yeah, it's, it's great fun. I've now been doing it for nine months. I'll be doing it for another year. And we're sort of getting ready for the next step, which is to sort of turn it into a department store of brain food. One of the most interesting things about what is, hasn't happened yet in journalism is that we, we still write one version of an article. And so if you know more than a journalist about the article, it's really boring. Because, say, for Syria, you know that, that Assad is an Alawite, and you know that the Russians have a, a naval base in Tartus, and you know about the Israeli occupation of the Golan Heights, and you know all these things, so where's the good stuff? Whereas outsiders, they don't know all these things, and so they 
they, they need to be served too with the same article. I think the next, the future is to have a department store of brain food and ask, okay, what is your level of prior knowledge? What is your level of engagement? And depending on it, would you like a five minute piece or a 10 minute piece or a 20 minute piece? And depending on where you want to go next. So now already on the blog, you can, you can go, so these are the most popular interviews by Facebook, by, tweet, by Twitter, most commented upon, most uh, read. Uh, these are my own favorites and this is why. And so you, basically what you, I think, f can get is a personal shopper. So you sort of say you want to know more about climate science or about the world of finance or about Islam or about Kabul. And there, somewhere on the web, somebody will be sharing his, his or her learning curve. And if you go there, the, 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 the author of the learning curve will say, look, um, you want to know more about climate science? You don't know anything? I was where you are now a year ago. And this is where you can go next, depending on how much time you have and what you want to do. And so this, to me, also as a user, I would think it's fa that would be just fantastic. And yeah, that's it. Um, I remember when Lehman Brothers crashed in uh, 2008. I'm self-employed, and I was really worried about my savings because I realized that was actually a misnomer. They weren't safe. And so I went online, and I started reading about the financial sector. And I got only more confused. And I thought, if only there would be a personal shopper for me saying, hi, yours, you're worried about your savings. I was worried about my savings. And so where do you want to go next? So that would be the next uh, step. But um, yeah, um, it's great fun. I'm still flapping furiously. And um, who knows? Next, you'll have one about the EU, about climate science, and these sort of things. Um, yeah, I wish I had a great sentence to end it with, but I don't. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>